This is Dr. Jason Engel from Washington, D.C., and today I'll be showing you a hand-assisted laparoscopic radical nephrectomy. The case that we'll be presenting today is of a 72-year-old man who had an incidental finding of a very centrally located right-sided renal mass, which I will show you. He had no comorbidity, normal renal function, no diabetes or hypertension. As you can see here, his tumor is very centrally located. This would be an extremely difficult partial nephrectomy to perform, and in my practice in a 72-year-old man with few comorbidities, uh, I still do perform nephrectomies. I don't find that all patients need a partial nephrectomy at all cost. Here the port placement for a hand-assisted nephrectomy on the right side is shown. I place the patients in a bean bag in a full flank position and I usually use a small 7 centimeter muscle splitting incision to place the hand port as you can see. Two additional 10 ports are placed, one inside the umbilicus and I'll be using a 3 millimeter alligator grasper to hold the liver up. Inspection of this patient's abdomen uh, will nicely uh, show all the organs. Here my hand is being placed through the hand port. It will be sealed around my hand so as to create a good laparoscopic insufflation seal. Here I'm showing the placement of that 3 millimeter grasper as a self-retaining retractor for the liver and it works quite nicely. No extra port is placed for this. The gallbladder there is seen, the liver is seen, and in this thin patient you can see his kidney very nicely. I start all kidney cases with a formal takedown of the line of tolt. I do this even with a partial nephrectomy for mobilization reasons. One thing to note and one thing that's very different about how I do hand assisted surgery I find uh, between be, com, as compared to those that are a bit less uh, experienced than myself is I generally am going to use the hand as a retractor not really as the dissector. Um, this is in contrast to many others that use the hand as the dissector but in essence what I'm doing is a laparoscopic nephrectomy almost in every way I'm just utilizing the hand as a much better retractor than I would otherwise be able to use uh, if I was doing this purely laparoscopically. One can see how quickly I can take down the line of Tolt and my goal here of course is to be holding things for my harmonic scalpel um, but I don't need to cut most things. I'm going to carry this, for, especially for a nephrectomy, all the way to the side of the liver to the diaphragm because the goal ultimately is to get my hand over the top of the kidney and to be able to sweep all of the gerotus fat downwards and when this, once this occurs the case gets actually much simpler because the kidney will now very much be in full view. Here you can see one of the largest advantages of having my hand and that is the ability to sweep everything downwards. I'm going to take the peritoneum in a safe area along the liver edge all the way to the incision that I made near the diaphragm. And the important thing is to get over the top of the kidney. Now that that's been done, my next step is going to be to take down the duodenum and the colon, and that's what I was just showing there. Again, note that I'm using the hand as a retractor. This is exactly how I would be dissecting the kidney for a partial nephrectomy. I'm finding that plane where the colon sits upon ger the gerotus fat, and I'm going to go ahead and mobilize the colon downwards. Of course, on the right side, the main things to look out for would be the duodenum. There we're seeing bowel, probably duodenum under the colon. And again, noted is that I'm using the fingers as a dissector, really only so as to be able to then hold it as a retractor. I dissect with my hand only to create largely retraction points. 
Here you can see I'm using two fingers as a retractor. I'm also using my pinky finger to push the kidney laterally, and I'm probably using my thumb to push the bowel medially. So some time is, is taken here to get into this plane to make sure the duodenum is out of the way. Another hallmark of when I do a hand-assisted case is that classically I'm not necessarily looking for structures. I'm systematically finding planes and the structures that I need to see if this is done religiously tend just simply to fall into view. There you were starting to see the renal vein. At this point with the duodenum down and the bowel down I'm going to go ahead and free up the lower pole and finish the mobilization of the colon and I usually take this all the way down to the pelvis. And one of the great things about this is with the hand I can hold the kidney straight up. There's the vena cava. We can actually see an aberrant vessel here that doesn't belong. It's a crossing vessel. In this case a non-pathologic crossing vessel. But notice I'm not dissecting it. The step I'm on right now is holding up the lower pole and finishing the colon. And that's what I'm doing right now. And whatever structures come into view just happen to come into view. Here again I'm marching up the vena cava so I know I don't need to be more medial than that. Here you can see there's this another small crossing vessel that doesn't really belong there, either an aberrant gonadal or something going to the kidney. Again though, I'm not going to spend any time looking for that. What I just did is I got onto the psoas and now that I'm on the psoas I'm going to march up. I'm going to meet up with the renal vein that I saw previously and I thought this was a good case for demonstration purposes. Here are several vessels that really don't belong. Uh, perhaps you can see a small crossing artery and vein there. At this point with the duodenum down there's usually one more plane of fascia and you can see it very clearly with the kidney being held straight up with the thumb and forefinger. I'm actually expecting to see this plane and it's under this plane that you all always get a very plain view of the main renal vein. Notice I didn't really look for the vein. What I was doing was I was following this very predictable fascial plane that occurs one level beneath the plane developed to mobilize the duodenum. Now I'm going to come across the top of the kidney. I typically will release gerotus fat in this location because I want to spare the adrenal. And this is what I'm doing here. You can actually see that the renal vein is starting to branch here. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to gently get to the point where I can see the parenchyma of the kidney so that I know there are no more vascular structures. And once I'm able to achieve this, since I've already swept the gerotus fat down from the upper pole, I will usually create some windows in this fat. It's my intention to staple this fat and, and merely know that the adrenal will be in this fat closer to the vena cava. This fat oftentimes can bleed. This is especially true on the left side, so I usually do use a stapler and not a harmonic scalpel as the most efficient, safest way to handle this. Again, you'll notice I'm using always two hands to dissect. I'm using either my sucker or my hand as a retractor, but one of the hallmarks of how I operate is there are very few times where I'm ever uh, operating with only one hand. This is very crucial to understand with the hand in place because the inexperienced surgeon can fall into a trap of only using the hand, which is not a very effective thing to do. Here I'm finishing the upper pole and the fat. I know that I've spared this patient's adrenal at this point. I know that I've come across the upper pole. And really now, all that's left in this nephrectomy 
is to hold now the kidney straight up. You've already seen the renal vein. And what I'm seeking to do now is to put my fingers behind the hilum. And now I am going to dissect out all of the vessels that I've witnessed and run into. Here you can see I'm working on that crossing vessel um, inferiorly. But notice how I'm really creating retraction points. Here I'm using my thumb as a retractor to hold straight up. And the ultimate goal is to have my middle finger completely around the hilum and then push on the hilum. And this pushes the artery usually out from underneath the vein. And it's in this way that I can dissect out all of the vessels. Here I'm pushing on the artery, and you can see very nicely how that demonstrates it to me. Eventually I'm going to be able to suck over my finger and create a window. Now what I'm doing is I'm going retroperitoneally on the psoas. I'm going to completely mobilize this kidney so I'll be able to completely hold it straight upwards. There's the psoas. Notice I have not finished the hilum at this point. I've identified it so that I know if there's bleeding I can go get it. But for me, and this is also different than other surgeons, I tend to get the hilum as the last step. Uh, that way I can see every single vessel that's there. There's no way that I'm going to confuse myself and potentially uh, take the interior, inferior mesenteric artery. That's a complication that can occur with big tumors. Uh, so once I'm at this step, I know that all I'm doing now is releasing the lateral attachments and I have a little more work to be done on the hilum. Notice I've not looked for the ureter. This is the first time I am looking for the ureter and there it is. Um, it's really one of the last steps that I do. And again, I thought this was a good case to showcase because I was not expecting to see all these aberrant vessels. You can see an aberrant gonadal vessel. Here I'm taking something that's not a vessel. But in view here is an aberrant gonadal, a crossing artery, and vein. And none of it really matters if you follow all these steps. Finally, my finger has now been completely passed underneath. And the last step on the right side usually is to get the artery. And with my finger underneath, I can pull it out from underneath the vein, which is what I'm doing here. Otherwise, it can be very much behind the vein. And notice, I'm not rubbing on the artery, I'm rubbing on my finger. And as I keep doing this, it comes more and more to light. Now you can see my finger underneath, and I'm practically very much ready to see that I have a window for the stapler. Once I see my finger on both sides, I know that I have a good window, uh, especially since I know that if I hold the kidney up, there's nothing behind me to get in front of the stapler. And now I have my window, even to the degree that I can put my finger through there. So you can see clearly that I'll be able to pass the stapler here. Notice I always have upward traction. The vessels are always under tension. It would never be safe for me to be manipulating these vessels if they were not under traction. Here I can see clearly these are not going to the mesentery of the bowel. These are all things that will have to be taken. I usually use the harmonic scalpel for lymphatics. And at this point, I'm simply preparing the kidney to fire staples. I've identified arteries. I've identified the veins. Here, there are several aberrant arteries and veins. But you can see that if you follow the steps of a hand-assisted procedure, they will all come into view. And eventually, they'll be taken care of. Here. The ureter is in view, and now it is for the first time that I will go ahead and take 
tissue on the side of the ureter and now only structures that need to be taken are left. There's various ways to take these vessels. These small aberrant vessels I'm taking with small metal clips. Now I'm thinking in terms of taking the arteries. Of course we're going to take the arteries first before the veins. Here's the main renal artery. We tend to use an automatic firing stapler, but of course a manual stapler would work just as well. Here is what I had perceived to be an aberrant crossing artery, so um, from a purist sense it would make sense to go ahead and take this next. So that's what I'll do. This is not a typical artery seen in most cases, and it was not causing obstruction to his renal pelvis. Now I can see that what is left behind are veins. I'm not going to get too close to the cava, but I do want to get this before it branches, as you can see I've done here. What's simply left here are a few lymphatics, and you can see one more vein. Typically, I try to get the vessels, of course, isolated. After this vein is taken, all that should left, be left behind is really the ureter. The ureter for me is classically the last thing that I take. I typically use metal sutures. If it's a hydronephrotic ureter, I might use a wet clip. Of course, if there's any suspicion of reflux, you take the clip. One could leave the ureter open. I usually don't. And here is the kidney specimen. Of course, we don't see this patient's tumor because it's very much centralized. I'm not worried, therefore, about seeding anything here, lest I would be putting it in a lap sack. And you can see I can simply pull it straight out of the abdomen. In this case, there was minimal bleeding, but uh, what is usually done at this point is a sponge is put in place, and I will go ahead and sponge any bleeding that has occurred. I'm going to want to inspect the stumps. Here, the insufflation pressure would have been turned down to a pressure of 5 to show that there's no oozing or bleeding. There you can see the staple line on the renal vein. Here's the vena cava. You can see the accessory artery and the stump of the artery. None are leaking. This all looks satisfactory. I have my own internal rule that if the sponge still has white on it, we're not bleeding. Here's the bivalve kidney of this case. You can see how centrally located this tumor was you can see that we would have had to do a, an actual hemi-nephrectomy, which would be fraught with potential complication to remove that. The operative, operative time was 32 minutes, which is typical of a hand-assisted case. He went home on post-operative day one with a creatinine of 1.2. This happened to be a chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, and all margins were negative. Again, this is Jason Engel showing a hand-assisted laparoscopic nephrectomy a very useful tool in a urologist's armamentarium for a kidney tumor.